A couple of summers ago, I don't know, it was one year, two years, three years, four years, I don't know, don't think more than three or four years, that the, the second wife of the, uh, the uh, prize fighter, world championship fighter, Muhammad Ali, came to our church. Yes, she did. And um, she came to our church, um, and we were, at the time we were out in the courtyard, she came. And it was during the time when Muhammad Ali had just died. And they uh, were having a, f a funeral worship for him, a funeral service for him here in the Harlem area. And she attended. And after the funeral, she came to our church. It's true. It's true. It is true. She came to our church after the funeral. And, um, and she asked to speak with me. And she said, her husband was the greatest, the champ, that her husband was the greatest, that he was a champ. And she said there at that uh, when she came to our church to visit with us, she said that uh, that I am the greatest preacher ever. She said I was just like her husband. She said her husband was great. He was a champ. And she says that she said that I'm the greatest preacher ever. Now, that's what she said. I don't ask you, you don't have to believe that, right? You don't, have, you don't have to agree with her. I'm just telling you what she said. You don't have to agree with her. I'm telling you what she said. She said, I was the, I'm the, she said, you are the greatest preacher ever. She said that to me. Now, she had an entourage with her. She had a security forces with her. She had just come from the funeral of her husband. Remember when Muhammad Ali, Ali died two or three years ago? Well, they had a funeral right here in Harlem for him. And after her husband's funeral, she came to see me. Yes, she did. And she said, I'm the greatest preacher ever. Now, I want to, I want to, why do I want to say that? I want to pause to say that because I have been preaching. I have been preaching, trust in the Proverbs chapter 3 for the past 14 years. And uh, during that, I have been preaching the word of God, preaching the law, preaching God's word, preaching, preaching God's word, preaching against spiritual wickedness in high places, preaching against Obama, preaching against tribulation Trump, preaching against LGBTQ, preaching against Black Lives Matter. I've been preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching. And, preaching. and a lot of times, you know, I'd get up and I'd be preaching about the son of Satan. I'd be preaching about the servant of Satan and on and on and on. And I've been doing it for 14 years. And the Lord said to me that, uh, that this, this message, these, these sermons have come up as a memorial before him. Now, um, so I, but what I want to say to you, that she has been listening to me for all those years. That's the wife. I think we have some other shots of her, but that's her. And she told me to put your fist up like the champ. You know how, you know how Muhammad Ali used to put his fist up? You know, like the champ. And we actually have our own tape saying the champ. But here, here's what I want to say to you. This is the wife of Muhammad Ali. When I was just a boy, you know, everybody loved to watch him fight. His wife came by and said, you're the greatest preacher ever. And the reason why she said that is because I preach God's word. I don't preach fables. I don't preach against the law. I don't preach ideas of modern newfangled ideas. All right. I wanted to be able to say that. And there have been people that have stayed with me over the past 14 years while I preach trust in the law with all thine heart, lean not to thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge. And many of them have come here. They've had problems. And yet I was preaching against spiritual wickedness in high places, but they never faltered. Many came were sick with having cancer and other kinds of sicknesses and diseases. And I was preaching against the spiritual wickedness of the long legged Mac Daddy Obama or the tribulation that Donald John Trump was bringing. And yet they stayed right here with me. While I was preaching, because the word of God will take care of your every need. The word of God is sufficient unto every cause. So let's go back to Solomon now. Go back to those jewels that were given by Madre Bowman. Verse 7, it says, Be not wise in thine own eyes, for the Lord, fear the Lord rather, and depart evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with the substance of 
uh, with thy substance. That's what whatever possessions or money or job or paycheck you have, honor the Lord, honor him. And with the first fruits of all thine increase. And so shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. Need to be weary of his correction. That's another thing. I do a lot of rebuke and I do a lot of correction. I will, I will correct you as long as I love you and long as I see that you are going wrong. And I'm trying to, I will rebuke you up and down Main Street as long as I love you. And when I stop rebuking you, it means it's all over with. It's I'm through. But don't despise it when I, when I correct you. Don't despise it. And I try to, when I tell you something, you listen to me. It means I love you. For whom the Lord loveth, he corrected. You see? Verse 12. Even as a father, the son in whom he delighted. So don't, don't get angry when I correct you. Don't go run off and get your mouth stuck all out, you know, long as a mouth and looking like an old mule or something. When I correct you, it means I love you. And that's why God corrects all of us. And he sends the word to correct us, to rebuke us, to set you straight. Because you need to be corrected. All right? Don't get an attitude. Say, praise God. Verse 13, happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things that thou canst as I cannot be compared unto her. So there you have it. Now, that's not all. That's not all of, 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 uh, of, of Matthew, I mean, Matthew, of Proverbs chapter 3. That's not all. That's just 14, 15 verses of it. But my friends, that's it. That's it, my friends. That's it. Solomon had this. Solomon had jewels just like this. Solomon had it. And he said the word of God about the Sabbath, about the tithe, The word of God about the Sabbath. Listen to me, brother. Listen to me. Listen to me, man. <laughs> you, you, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, the devil is real. And he got people, he got people, you know, he tricked Eve and Adam into violating the Sabbath and the law. He did. No, he did. And you see what happened to them? You, you see what happened to them. And, and just because you go to some barn or some building on Sunday, the devil got you. The, the, the Sabbath is the law. The tithe is the, the devil got you, man. He, he, he told you to keep your money for yourself. Don't tithe. Give 10% of your income. And yeah, you're making $1,500 a week. You ain't going to give $150. The devil said, don't give $150 to the Lord, to the church. Give them $10 to $15 maybe, but don't give them $150. And you can go to church on Sunday. Well, you have to remember, Eve and Adam were a whole lot smarter than you, my brother. Eve and Adam were a whole lot smarter, and the devil got them, and they died. The devil got them, and they died. Adam didn't have to work. Adam didn't have to go out there and punch the clock. But after he, the devil got him and caused him to violate the law, the Bible said he had the earnings living by the sweat of his brow. The devil got Adam, and Adam was a whole lot smarter than you, man. He was a whole lot smarter than you. And the devil tricked him. The same way the devil tricking all these people running into these barns and these buildings on Sunday. The devil got him. The devil tricked Adam. The devil tricked Eve. She was smarter than you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. And they had, they had jewels. They had a life. They were in the garden. They had power and dominion. And the devil told them that you don't have to keep God's word. You can eat from any tree you want. You can eat that pig if you want. You can eat that swine if you want. You can eat anything you want to eat. And they started eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they died. They got poor. They got sick. And they died. Same thing going to happen to you. Wake up, man. Wake up. Wait, keep the Sabbath. Don't ever get a paycheck and don't give God 10% of it. Keep the Sabbath. Keep the tithe. And stop eating that swine and them, 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 them fish without scales. 
offends. Don't listen, man. The, the devil, you, you say the preacher said, well, now you can do what you can now do what Adam and Eve did and you ain't going to die. You can now eat the swine. You can now feel, feel, refuse to tithe, tithe and you don't have to keep the Sabbath. And yet God's going to favor you. Well, he'd have to he'd have to apologize to the rest of the world. He don't apologize to Adam and Eve for killing them. But but Solomon had it like this. Solomon had it like this. And Solomon says, my brother, he said, my son, let me tell you something. It's beautiful and as precious as these things are. Solomon said keeping the word of God is a whole lot better than this, this gold and jewelry right here. Solomon said keeping the word is a whole lot better than this. That's what Solomon said. And he had it. And you ain't got it. And don't keep the word. That's what he said. He said, keeping the word is better than this, man. Huh? It's more precious than, than, than rubies and fine gold. Keep the word. He said, Pastor Manny, you preach about that Sabbath all the time. Because I'm trying to help you. You know, I was talking about the woman uh, that Muhammad Ali's wife came. She came to she, Muhammad Ali's wife came, and she came right from us directly from her husband's funeral. And she embraced me and said, "You the champ." You know, I think what she probably she was saying in her heart, "Well, my husband the champ is dead, but Pastor Manny, now you the champ." That's what she said. That's what the woman said, and everybody in the church heard her say it. That's what the woman said. She said, "Pastor Manny, you the champ." And I put up my fist, and she put up her fist. She said, you the champ. Why? Because I preach God's word. And she listened to it. And her life is made the richer and the better. We're talking about Muhammad Ali's wife. Right? The one that bore all them children. So Solomon said, the word of God is more precious than this, brother. <laughs> You're going to keep on violating the word of God. You let these old pork chop eating preachers stand up in the pulpit and tell you that these old, uh, if, if you will, red lobster, lobster eating preachers stand up in the pulpit and tell you. You let these old lobster eating preachers, pork chop eating, swine eating preachers stand up in the pulpit and tell you you can eat swine and don't have to keep the Sabbath. Well, that's the same thing, that same, that same thing the devil told Eve and Adam. But Solomon said, my son, forget not the law. Keep the law. Live the days long life. All that you're going to have. All that you're going to have if you keep the law. I want to ask you to come up close for just one second. And I, I want to talk to three year and older veterans of the uh, Trust in Lord Hour uh, the Open Rewards Prayer Meeting, the Manning Report, and the Pulpit of Power, those four ministries that we do every week, uh, producing at least 20 different ministries or sermons every week. If you are a three-year or older veteran, by old I mean four years, five years, six years, seven years, 10 years, 12 years uh, old veteran of, of any of these ministries that we do on a daily basis every week, and you are not a supporter. You've not joined with the uh, the ministry to give your uh, to pledge your support and your alignment with what we've been teaching. I and I, my question is why? I, you've had three years to observe us. You've had three years to listen to us on a daily basis, all weekend, all day long, any hour of the day. We're uh, broadcasting. Uh, you've had three years to watch our various successes. You've three years to watch our ups and downs. You've had three years to listen to the tenor or the consistency of what we have said, whether we are consistent or whether we are all over the chart and what we do and what we believe. You've had three years to watch people around us who have made the commitment to join with our ministry and church and to financially support it. And by the way, I want to give another shout out to Brother Jesse Munez out there in San Bernardino, along with uh, uh, Goldfinger, who is just extraordinary giver, and others that do extraordinary uh, giving to our ministry. My question is to you, if you are a three-year veteran or older, why haven't you joined? Why haven't you committed? 
And I suppose some of the reasons was, well, Pastor Man, I belong to another church. And uh, why? How could you, how could you, after three years of hearing me teach about the Sabbath, about righteousness, about the tribulation, and listen to me faithfully as you do, and still go sit up in another pastor's face? How could you be? It's like you, it's like a woman sleeping with two men. You know, one she likes during the week and the other she likes on the weekend. It is hypocritical. Um, how could you do that? I mean, as I say, you start three months ago, I can understand. Well, it may take you some time to evaluate. It may take you some time to look at me, to discover, you know, who I am. You say, well, pastor, that's not that. I don't belong to another church or ministry. I, I, you, I'm with you. But there's some things you say I like, and there's some things you say I don't like. Why? Why is it that some, you, you've made a decision that there's some things that, that you don't like are stronger than the things that you do like. I, you know, I am not a psychiatrist, but I am an analyst. And I have to tell you, I analyze the world, I, I understanding. The, the understanding and wisdom tells me this, that if there are things that a person such as myself that I am saying, there, there is no room to disagree with what I am saying, unless your purpose is to find something to disagree with. Let's say, for instance, you say, well, I like the fact that you talk about Obama, but I don't like the fact that you talk about Trump. Let's say, for instance, you're one of those, right? Well, the purpose, it isn't that you, it isn't that you just like what I say about Obama, but don't like what I say about Trump. What it is, is that you are looking for a reason to support Trump. It isn't that you don't like it. It's just that you don't like the fact that I'm saying something about it. It isn't that what I'm saying is wrong. Let me put it that way. It isn't what I'm saying is wrong or indifferent. You know it's right. But you have, you've lived your life or you've come up or you've been raised with a doctrine that you can really live in a false reality. That's where you are. You've been raised in a doctrine that you can live in a false reality. That is to say you can like the truth about Obama but you don't like the truth about Trump. And it's the same truth. It's the same truth. There's no difference. But because you have been indoctrinated to live in a false reality, you are really a person who needs psychological debriefing. But trust me, there are zillions of people around the world who live that way. I, there are people who know what I'm saying about Trump. Obama is right. They know it. But they choose to ignore it based on the fact that they find a reality that isn't true and they've settled in there. Say, well, that's one of the reasons why I'm not made a commitment because, you know, I, I, I don't like, the fact, I wish you would support what I support. But the, the truth of the matter is, then why do you come? You've given three years or more of your life to listen to me? Three years of your life to listen to me, and you know you and you're not tired of listening to me yet. And you've given three years of your life, and over the past three years, your life has been greatly upgraded. You've learned, you've been educated, you've been enlightened. And let me say this to you. If you make the commitment, say, well, Pastor, I'm joining with you, and I'm going to support. I'm going to do the tithe and offering. I'm going to do the first fruit. I'm going to keep the Sabbath. Your life is going to soar. Now, listen to me very carefully. Now, I'm not going to leave you alone after this. Listen to me very carefully. You come as often as you come over the past three years because you're being helped. You're being educated. You're being enlightened. Right? Right. But the thing that you... Like whether you, you say, well, I like what you say about Obama, but I don't like what you say about Trump. You do the same thing with the word of God, such as you like the things I say, the teachings that I say, the way I explain the Bible, the way I break it all down and make it clear. But when it comes to things like money or tithing and offering or the Sabbath, well, that, you know, is also true. But because of your false reality, because you really need a psychological debriefing because of your false reality, you choose not to believe the tithe or the first fruit or the Sabbath. Now, it isn't that it isn't true. It's as true as all the other things I've said. 
But you live in a false reality where you, avoid, you try to ignore the truth about the tithe, and so you don't do it. But, it, not, it's not, but the, everything else I say is good to go. Everything I ever say is good to go, good enough to share with your friends. It makes you laugh. It educates you. It enlightens you. But the tithe, well, and the full commitment to the ministry, well, the first fruit offerings, well, the Sabbath, that, that's all true as well. But you have chosen and you've been raised and indoctrinated to have a dual reality, which is dangerous. Jesus said this, and I'll leave you. He said, I would rather you be the hot or cold, but not lukewarm. You're lukewarm. You have a dual reality. He said, if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. I would rather you be completely stomped down against Pastor Manny, trying to, dis trying to take him down. Be fully against him. Be against him with all of your strength. Or be fully for him with all of your strength. But don't be in the middle somewhere lukewarm. You're better than to be spit out of the mouth of Jesus if you're lukewarm. So what's it going to be? You're going to make the commitment and grow and be even greater, better blessed, or you're going to continue to walk in the lukewarm spit of the mouth of the Savior. I'm James David Manning, everybody. I'm the Lord's servant. 